I'm so blessed to have literally the man, the myth, the legend in the thyroid space, Paul Robinson. Paul and I have been trying for one year to, to make this happen, to have this conversation for you guys. So I'm just super pumped that he's on. Hi, Paul. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for talking to me, Amy. Amy. Yeah, it's no. been a, we've had a few things get in the way and I'm looking forward to it as well. Absolutely. I'm not sure about the myth and legend bit. Oh, excuse that. That's a gardening incident. <laughs> no, no, you really are. You totally are. Your books have changed, well, people's lives, thyroid patients' lives, but also they've changed the minds of some practitioners because I know many people who have handed your book to a practitioner to open their eyes to the power of T3. So you really, I mean, you really are a powerful force in this whole thyroid community. Yeah, I wish it was more so in the UK, but not so many practitioners over here have actually um, taken it on board yet, but we'll see. And it's a shame. I mean, I see this daily in my practice, but yet I'm still amazed. I don't know why I'm still amazed, but I'm still amazed at the amount of just the lack of knowledge, the lack of true knowledge when you just look at biology and you look at how the body works and we go back to the medical textbook of what does the pituitary do and what does the thyroid do? And yeah. it, it amazes me that people, the practitioners are still stuck in this old, old, old paradigm of, of thinking and they can't break out. Yeah. TSH. Very reliable. <laughs> yeah. Should we should we say more now? We just leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> and that's probably the single biggest thing I hear from patients all the time. Um, I'm not sure whether this is a bit too detailed straight away, but this whole idea that TSH is just complete reliable. You can put your trust in it. Doesn't matter what happens, it's always right. People wear glasses, people have hearing aids, people have heart problems, lung problems, liver problems. They need insulin, they have joint problems, muscle problems. But my goodness me, the pituitary is always perfect, spot on, never wrong. TSH is completely reliable. <laughs> so we're up against that still, I'm afraid. We are still up against that. And I still see doctors freak out over low TSH too. And, and that amazes me. And so even, and I try to tell that, and I know we're just kind of conversing right now. We'll get into subjects here soon. But it still amazes me that a, a, a doctor will base it on TSH alone. And yet they're the same doctor that's giving copious amounts of T4 to this person, which can also push down and suppress TSH. So I, I, I still see it on, on a daily basis. But if we can yeah. change one practitioner at a time, then I think it's worth it. Okay. Yeah. I well, hope we can. So, Paul, I know you've gone through your own health struggles. I think many people have heard your story, but can you, can you give us the brief version of when you were misdiagnosed, just, just like myself, I mean, you and I are very yeah, similar. We're both T3 only. Story. We're both misdiagnosed. Yeah. 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 I haven't done this story for a long time, so uh, okay. I will try and keep it brief. Um, but yeah, I was um, a young man, 30, 29, 30, very happy, great job, successful, it felt great, never really had many health issues. And then over a couple of years, I went downhill and found myself not remembering people's names and put weight on and all the usual stuff that we know now is associated with hypothyroidism. So I went to my family doctor and she did some tests and lo and behold, I had incredibly low thyroid levels and very, very high autoantibody levels because she tested them. She even tested FT3, for goodness sake, which a lot of them don't. Right. Um, and uh, and I, she said, you've got something called Hashimoto's, but you'll be fine. Just take this little bottle of pill, hit one pill a day to start with, and you'll be completely well. <laughs> and that little pill was levothyroxine or Synthroid. Yeah. And I actually had two weeks where it took me from feeling absolutely terrible to quite a bit better. But those are the best two weeks I ever had on it during the seven years that I took it. And after that, it was just all downhill from then on. And uh, I, I could never get well. They said that I, I saw, I must've seen about six or seven endocrinologists. Half yeah. of them were ones I had to pay for because I got sick of the other ones. Mm -hmm. 
and every time I paid for one, I was thinking, oh, this is this. I'm paying for this. This guy's really going to listen to me. It's going to be great. But the same old, same old thing. We've done the test. Your TSH is kind of okay. Your FT3 is in range. It's okay. It's fine. You should be fine. There's nothing wrong with you. It's not thyroid anymore. Right. I'm thinking, I have the same. I had this conversation with so many of them, Amy. I said, I have the same symptoms now that I had when I was diagnosed. And I didn't have any of them before Hashimoto's. Now you're telling me I've got the same symptoms, but it's something else, even though my lab numbers are in range. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, it's something else. And I said, okay, find it. And they would say, well, no, I've done my job. Uh, it's not thyroid, um, nothing else we can do for you. So yeah, that went on for a long time. And eventually I found someone to give me T3 who had no clue how to use it. And I had to do my own research and I spent two or three years eventually figuring out that I had to dose it in a certain way to make it work for me. And then I was fixed. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of the potted summary. It was 10 years of pain in which I lost my career and it damaged family relationships. And um, it was a disaster in terms of what it did to me personally. And well, as it does to many, many people that don't get treated quickly. I was just you get treated say, quickly like, with the yeah. right treatment. Yeah. It's great. I was just going to say that I'm glad that you mentioned the the job and the family aspect, because I don't think we focus on that enough. You know, obviously we're focused on the patient and the symptoms, or if it's yourself, you're focused on you, but you're not realizing, or you are realizing, and it's not talked about enough, the destruction that goes around around you, that goes on around you. So yeah. you might be too tired to even go to your job or do adequate work to be able to keep your job. You yeah. might be too tired to do anything and your spouse doesn't understand and your friends don't understand. So it has hypothyroidism absolutely affects the person on a yeah. deep, deep level, but it has these fingers that go out and it, start, it, it starts affecting other people in your life. Absolutely. Well, I was basically at the worst of it. I was virtually an invalid. I could basically had to sleep on the sofa during the day. I had to go up upstairs to sleep during the day, but I had to go up on my hands and legs you know yeah. i couldn't walk up i was too tired too physically debilitated to do it and yeah. pass out regularly it was just terrible and um if that you know people can be really ill but if they get treated and they're, they're completely well within two years that damage is isn't done to the same extent right and it's a, it's a it's quick diagnosis and quick treatment and, and trying different therapies properly that can stop that damage it's when it goes on for years and it goes on for years in so many cases. And that's where the, the real problems come in terms of the, you know, the, the larger effect to the person. Absolutely. And that's why we want to catch it early. And just like you, Paul, I was misdiagnosed six times. I was put on Synthroid T4. For, I, I gave it about five months. And then I was like, time out. This isn't doing anything. This is horrible. So I started doing my own research and I found this thing called T3. So I'm going to let you, I mean, I speak on it all the time because it saved my life, but I want you to dive into a little bit more about that power of T3 because you have a book out all about T3, using T3 to literally reverse hypothyroidism, help hy hypothyroidism, reverse your symptoms of hypothyroidism and its relationship to cortisol. So that's where we're going to go. So I'll let you start. Okay. <laughs> Big topic area. Um, I think what most um, what most patients when they first get diagnosed don't realize, and I would still say quite a lot of doctors don't realize, is that the T4 that they get the, that the, the doctors give the patients and the patients take is levothyroxine, synthroid, there are other brand names, but basically T4 is really pretty inert. It doesn't do a lot. It doesn't work inside the cells at the cell nuclei where everything happens it doesn't do anything it's not really a thyroid hormone at all it only works if the body if the cells in the body are able to convert it to the active hormone t3 so that you know that has that change has to occur within the cells mm -hmm. and if it doesn't occur sufficiently you don't get enough t3 then basically you don't have enough thyroid hormones. So you still have all the symptoms you had to start with 
or virtually all of them. Mm-hmm. So um, doctors, doctors often doctors don't fully understand that. Often they don't test free T3, which is the biologically available thyroid hormone. Mm-hmm. And they don't realize that simply having a number for T3, FT3, that's in that lab reference range, they don't realize that just being in there is enough. Yeah. It has to be at the right place in that range for that individual person. And that's very different by person. And the analogy I, I often use is if you've got a large barn door and you've got a white circle drawn on it and you've got a baseball and you throw it, having, a, having an FT3 in range is like having that baseball hit the barn door. Yep. That isn't success. It's only successful when it hits within that circle that's right for that individual. Mm-hmm. It has to be spot on. And it's really FT3 that has to be spot on. Absolutely. Rather than FT4, certainly rather than TSH. And, um, you know, that's the first thing. And, and, and sadly, that you mentioned education to start with. A lot of doctors don't even get that basic principle. Mm-hmm. I know. I, I don't get it either because it is so inactive. And I just did a podcast the other day, just kind of as a training, like a mini training for practitioners, really going back to the basics and reviewing the fact that T4 is inactive. Why are we even still relying on that? Is is there even a point to T4 in your opinion? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great treatment for many people, particularly those people that have very, very good ability to convert T4 to T3. And if, if they've got a largely working thyroid gland that maybe isn't working as well as it can, um, then they can do really well on T4 um, if they convert it well. So I've had people that come, have come to me who are on T3 and they say, I can't really get well. And I say, OK, tell me about your history. And they give me, go through the history and they've been on T4, mm-hmm. but their doctor stopped increasing it because TSH was low. Right. right. So right. I said, well, what, why didn't you, you were you were improving with your FT3 level on that? Why, why didn't he go up higher on the T4 and ignore the TSH? Because you were getting better. Right. And I've gotten to go back on T4 from T3 okay. and, and just increase it beyond there. So they get enough free T4 three from it and they've been great and be able to take t4 once a day and get enough free t or free t3 from it is a great solution it's so much simpler for them but it just doesn't work in in a lot of cases correct so i'm not anti t4 i've never have been but because i'm well associated with t3 people think i am I'm, i'm actually not i think all the treatments have a real place no, Paul, again, this is another area we're similar because I talk about T3 so much and I share the fact that I am on a, a higher dose of T3 only and I have been for 17 years. So this is what keeps me optimized. But people tend to think the same thing about me. I am not anti-T4. I wanted to get your opinion on the on the use of T4 in certain cases, like you said. And, and if we can... If we can keep a little bit of T4, if we can keep that in and give you that storage vat that's sitting there waiting to be used and your body can use it, then great. But if you give me T4, it just all goes (laughs) to hell in a handbasket because I go hypo in a week. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, I can take 10 micrograms of T4 and be hypo in a week. Yeah, exactly. Same, same, same. So when we're talking about cortisol, you really know this area. And that's why I wanted your your brain on this podcast, really diving into this. When you're talking, you had to do a lot of your own research on the effects of cortisol and how cortisol works with thyroid hormones. So start there with, with what got you into looking at the path of cortisol and the adrenals and its relationship to thyroid and then how important it is. Well, I got into it because I had to, because I was on T3 and I was still sick. I mean, it improved some things, but I was still sick and my symptoms fit low cortisol. I mean, I was very weak. I was had low blood pressure. I was regularly passing out still. Um, um, I'd lost a lot of weight. And um, I, I looked into it. I, 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 by this stage, I had a, a, 
a bookcase full of actual endocrinology books I, I bought from uh, a university book supplier. Um, and I went through it and yeah, I thought that the low cortisol fits this. So I asked my GP to test it in a blood test and then a 24 hour urine cortisol collection, which had free cortisol and total cortisol and everything came back super low. My, my cortisol results on the, on the 24 hour test looked like they were the X axis. They were just like, they were just, I think we were on the ground oh, and, yeah. and I, and I went to an endocrinologist <laughs> I should have learned much less than by this stage. <laughs> I know. I went, I went, went to an endocrinologist and I said, look, I've got these results, it's really awful. He said, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll do, a, we'll do a synaptin test, which is an ACTA stimulation test. We'll test you for Addison's. Now I'll be fine. So I went to hospital for you know, half a day or something. They did the test, came back, and I saw him again. And he said, oh, no, your, your response to the ACTA uh, stimulation was fine. You've not got Addison's, um, you're fine. It's fine. But I said, my, my, my normal cortisol levels are incredibly low. And he said, well, it's not Addison's, your adrenals are working, nothing I can do for you. I'm thinking, okay, um, so you're going to be around every day and give me ACTH injections to get my adrenals working? My adrenal yeah. was not putting cortisol out. So it looked like I had secondary um, hypercortisolism, right? Mm -hmm. So... But they weren't interested in doing anything because I passed the Addison's test. My adrenals were perfectly well. There was nothing wrong with them. They were in great shape. They just weren't putting anything out because there was no request coming in from the pituitary gland. So at that point, I knew I had a problem with cortisol. I just hadn't put two and two together until I read a couple of different endocrinology books and realized that the rhythm of cortisol production in the body is actually synchronized um, with the, um, the, the, the rhythm of FT3 in the body. And it turns out that the pituitary starts stimulating cortisol production with a, a, a signal called ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropic hormone, it starts stimulating it really hard in the middle of the night, very, very hard. The signal from the pituitary gets higher and more frequent. And it basically gets the cortisol starting to ramp up. So by the time you wake up in the morning, eight o'clock, you know, or whatever time you wake up, you, you've got, you're loaded up with cortisol, you're ready for the day. And, and that really works well. But for those people that don't have that normal rhythm, they wake up in the morning, they think, oh my God, I have to get out of bed. I can't do it. I'm dead. I can't, I can't do this. I'm so tired. Mm -hmm. And they're not good all day long, usually. And that was me. Yeah. Uh, however, as soon as I looked at all this, I thought, okay, I'm taking T3, but I'm taking T3 in the daytime. And I stopped taking it about six o'clock in the evening. I, I'm thinking, my T3 levels are now going to drop because it's not like the right. thyroid's working properly. My T3 levels are going to be a bit lower. And they're going to get lo really low by the time this, this, this in horrendous action happens from the pituitary to make cortisol go up. I thought, that's not a good combo. So uh, that's when I started to experiment with taking T3 in the night. Okay. And that's when, as soon as I did it, the first day I did it, I had a completely different response. I felt amazing. Oh my God. And uh, I kept doing it. And then I thought, let's, okay, let's do some science here. Yeah. So I went back to my GP. And the only test we had then was um, this 24 hour urine cortisol collection. And I said to her, I would like to do six or eight of these in a row, please. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it with different timings of this T3. And lo and behold, we did that. She was brilliant. She was absolutely really supportive. And Thank God she was because we did it. And and every time I took, if I started by taking a T3 dose when I got up mm -hmm. and then I took it half an hour earlier than an hour earlier than, until I got to four or five hours earlier than when I got up. Okay. And when we got the results, cortisol went up every time I took it earlier to the point that was optimal for me. I had, it was like a linear relationship. It was just clear cut. So... Mm -hmm. I kind of knew there's a relationship for some people, not everyone, but for some people that have low T3 in the night, 
that might have a really poor pituitary response and not be able to make the cortisol. And that's um, and that's kind of what I did for several years until my GP, the same one, um, suggested I actually wrote about it. And I just thought I was like this one person in the whole world that probably had this weird problem. Why would I want to write about it? I mean, it's like I thought I was weird, weird. You know, I just, just thought I was unique. Right. But eventually I did write about it and I coined the term the circadian T3 method mm -hmm. uh, or CT3M which is only, it's just for people that have low cortisol. And it, if, if they respond to it, then that's great. But it's, it's not, you know, it's not the whole of my protocol. Some people think I'm all about that. But again, it's just a minor, it's a minor part of um, what I've written about. But for me, it made the difference. It got me from on, being on T3 and having part of a solution, but to have the whole solution. And then I felt well for no, the I first time fast. in 10 years. That's fascinating. And that, I mean, that even being a, one of the components of your research is it's key because that little shift can help so many people. So I want to unpack that, just kind of break it down. Number one, it's sounding like, you know, we use the term adrenal fatigue so often, and it really isn't adrenal fatigue because like you said, your adrenals were just fine. It's more mm. like a pituitary fatigue or a T3 fatigue. I mean, there's something else going on where we always blame the adrenals themselves, but it might not be an adrenal problem at all. True. I mean, some people do genuinely have an adrenal problem, right. but I think the majority of the people that I work with, when be it's 60, 70% mm -hmm. of the people that I've worked with that have low cortisol, don't have a genuine adrenal problem. They have a low cortisol problem. And, and often, often it's because they haven't got enough T3 hormone during the 24 hours that they need it to make the pituitary work properly. And it's not always that, you know, I, I admit it's not always that, but there's a large number of people that do have that particular problem. So it's good to have a tool or something available to help with it when, when it's that. And sometimes it could be CT3M. Sometimes a low dose naltrexone does the same thing. Yep. Yeah, LDN is great too. So if you were back to your story, when you started dosing yourself earlier and earlier, let's say someone does have issues getting up in the morning. They are that like, oh my gosh, I can't get going. I'm drinking coffee. Nothing's happening. I'm not waking up. Do you suggest that they take, maybe wake up two hours before or four hours before since it T3 peaks at the four hour mark, how, how much earlier than their normal waking time when we want that cortisol high, should they take their T3 in the middle of the night? Well, I wouldn't, I would start do one step first. I'd make sure they made sure they test it properly. Mm -hmm. I want to see low cortisol. I'd like to test it a number of ways. I'd like to do a morning, an early morning blood test, just mm -hmm. a one-off blood test. I'd like to do a cortisol saliva test. Yep. And, I, and, and ideally, uh, an ACTH stimulation test, just to rule out Addison's. Okay. I mean, it's yep. good because cortisol's, you know, the symptoms of low cortisol overlap so many, in, with so many other conditions like hypothyroidism, like low B12, like a number of other things. It's really important to know you're dealing with low cortisol before you start trying to fix it. But if there is low cortisol and the person's got those problems, then normally I, it depends how bad it is. If it's like a, a minor thing, then I will, I usually suggest taking the a T3 dose an hour before they get up mm -hmm. and then moving it back by, by half an hour steps um, up to about four hours, sometimes a little bit further. But if someone's got absolutely awful low cortisol and definitely don't have Addison's, then I'd go straight to four hours before. Okay. I wouldn't mess about. I'd just do it like that and try and get something going on, try and get some confirmation, diagnostic confirmation that this is the problem we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Life's too short to mess about. And that's the problem, you know we talked about earlier I and mean, i think sometimes you just need to get on with it and try yeah. and fix things just do it just dive in and don't waste more time absolutely yeah. so how often do you dose your t3 during the day then i i only do twice a day just simply because that works for me i would cert i would be open to splitting it up if i needed to but what what is your take on on how often someone should be taking their t3 dose i think again it depends on how much they're taking 
what I don't tend to like too much is taking really huge doses of T3. At once. Um, I take 60 micrograms a day, which is not a massive dose of T3. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't want to be taking two doses of 30. It's, it's a lot. And I can do really well with a dose of 20 micrograms. I know I can. Mm -hmm. So I cho I've chosen to, to split it. Um, three times in 24 hours with a 20 microgram dose. Some people don't get a response from 20 micrograms. They might need 30 or 40 or even more. Right. But I think whatever right. dose you get a good response to, you shouldn't go way beyond that just to make sure you get two doses a day. Mm -hmm. It's better to have a good response and know you're not pushing the peaks of T3 too much. Right. Uh, and then you, okay, then you can have a more of a, a physiological delivery of T3, a more of an easy, smooth delivery of T3 to the body. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if you take it all at once or or twice a day, it can be too much for some people. I know, I know there are people that dose T3 once a day. I mean, Dr. John yeah. Lowe, almost an advocate of that. Yeah. I know people still do that. I tried that in my experiments in the past. I've taken 180 micrograms of T3 once a day. Yeah. I didn't feel very good on it, no. I can tell you. <laughs> like, there was no dose of T3 that left me feeling okay for 24 hours. I always got hypo anyway, yeah. but with a high dose, I got I felt awful. I felt oh, yeah, because well. you just spiked and then crashed the, on the other side. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I like T3 to be at a dose it, it, that works well mm -hmm. and not beyond, and then take another dose when it looks like that T3 is is starting to run out or at least just before then so that the person never feels hypo mm -hmm. but never feels hyper either yep that makes sense well now you said that you've you've taken your t3 all the way up to 6 p.m does that interfere with your sleep at all do you find people that do it three times a day and push it push it a little bit um, later in the day it starts messing with your sleep yeah it, when i first started when i had low cortisol um, yeah, it was it was terrible. I mean, I could not cope with a, a later dose mm -hmm. um, because it was it was arriving at the time when my cortisol was low. The T3 was coming in, but the cortisol was really low, and those two did not work together. T3 and cortisol need to be partners. Mm -hmm. They need to be both both together at the same place. Whereas you, you come in with a big dose of T3 and you've got super low cortisol, what the body is going to do is say. Okay, we need we need we need more steroids. So what we're going to do? We can't make cortisol. We'll make adrenaline, and so you get this massive adrenaline kick, and you can't sleep, and your heart's pounding, and mm -hmm. it's just horrible. So um, when I first started, I definitely could not take a later dose. I used to take it at three o'clock in the afternoon or four o'clock in the afternoon, right. and that was it. But now, after being on T three for so long, my cortisol is high end of normal. It's good. Mm -hmm. I could take it anytime. I often forget to take a dose of T3 and I might go 12 hours or longer and I'm just completely forgotten about it. And I don't notice it now because my yep. the rest of my system is so much more well balanced. Again, another similarity. I'm the same way. If I if I miss it or if I'm skipping it for for a blood draw, I don't really notice it. Whereas of course, when you're starting out and you're just getting optimized, you're gonna notice that missing dose big time. But okay. yeah. So, Paul, when we are, I want to rewind back to lab testing and kind of optimal labs because your analogy of the the bullseye on the barn is exactly what I use when I'm talking about all standard lab value ranges. The standard lab value range is out here; it's the barn, and then the optimal functional range where we want you on every single test is like a bullseye. So, for free T3, I always say the upper quadrant of the range or above. Now I still see, again, this is something else I see, conventional practitioners or even functional practitioners that are too stuck in conventional when it comes to the thyroid. They'll see a free T3, even if that person took 24 hours of no meds, they'll see a free T3 of a six and the cutoff was 4.5 and they freak out and call that person hyper. <laughs> <laughs> so can we talk about the, the ranges of free yeah. T3 when being tested? Yeah, um, well, this is another one of my bugbears. Um, 
with the with more, which I, I, I went on about TSH to start with by the whole idea that TSH is always right. You have to trust it. The other thing that, 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 that the endocrinologists and the GPs just just are blind to is the fact that these lab ranges are built from testing people that are either have no thyroid issue or are on levothyroxine. Right. We know for a fact, fact now, that when people are on levothyroxine, they tend to have a lower top of the range FT3 and slightly higher FT4 than normal healthy people. Right. So we know the lab ranges are based around combination healthy people and those people that are on levo. Who's ten so that tends to lower the top of the range anyway mm -hmm. um, of FT3. That's where it is. It's lower than it would be if it was just healthy people. But not only that, it's based around people with reasonably normal levels of T4 in their systems. It is not based on a cohort of people who are on T3. There ought to be a lab range, a set of lab ranges for people who are only on T3, but that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And my problem with that is that when you are on T4 and they draw the blood and they test FT4 and they test FT3, they're testing what's in the blood. They're not, they don't know what's in, in the cells in, act, in actuality. But within the cells, we know that some of that T4 is also getting converted and used, converted to FT3 and used. So those people on levothyroxine have more hidden FT3 within the cells than are showing up on the lab ranges. So limiting their FT3 in a lab range to X amount might be okay but if you're on t3 you haven't got that extra conversion you need more more leeway at the top of the range the, the current lab range for everyone across the world who is for ft3 is not a, not an acceptable level for those people on t3 only now having said that to go back to the original question what do i see as an optimal um yeah i'd say upper quadrant um maybe a bit above for those people on ft3 it depends on when you test it, when you test the T3, because you know very well if you take a T3 dose and you test FT3 two or three or four hours later, you're yeah. going to see a huge spike. <laughs> huge, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you, and, and if you leave it over 18 or 24 hours, that's going to come right down. Mm -hmm. So where do you test it even? Can you even test it and use it usefully? I don't know. It's hard to say. I, so I tend not to focus too much on on that it's nice to see the ft3 go up mm -hmm. so you know the person's absorbing the meds but i don't have a really a specific target because i don't really trust the use of the labs for people on t3 only or t3 mostly mm -hmm. i don't really trust them right um it's also possible that for someone you know some people might do really well with a mid-range ft3 mm -hmm. and if they do and they feel great and they've got no more symptoms that's great yep. fantastic Yep. It's all based on how you feel, 100% based on how you feel. But no, I agree with you. I I've, I, I know uh, L. Russ and I and, and you we're, all know each other and we'll tend to experiment. So I always tell my patients, if you're going to experiment, seeing where your level goes after you take your T3, do it with like a, a self-purchase lab so it doesn't run through your insurance and your doctor never has to see it. Because yeah. if you take your D3 and you come in at like an 11 for yeah. your FT3, they're going to freak out. So just do oh, that yeah. kind of on the side. But I've been wanting to do that just to, to take my usual morning dose and go two, three, four hours after just seeing where I go. Yeah. I mean, if, and if someone doesn't peak after that, they know they've got another problem going on. They know they've got the, an absorption problem. It's really nice to be able to see that that happens. But it's really not nice to see him sit, sit in front of a doctor who's telling you you're going to have a heart attack or you're going to lose all your bone density oh, within a week or something. Yeah, <laughs> same thing, same thing here. And they're still saying it to this day. It's been disproven, but they're still saying it. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, uh, Paul, one last thing. I, I, I don't know how long you have. I could talk forever. Um, one of your blogs, which I go to your blog all the time, 
to find different information. If I need, if I need a source, if I need a reference, I will go to your blog and see what references you used in order to get that information. I mean, it's, it's a, just a wealth of information. It's amazing. One of the articles that you wrote on, and I know kind of, we didn't even talk about this pre pre show here, but the relationship of estrogen to thyroid and cortisol, because I, as you know, a lot of hypothyroidism, Hashimoto patients are women. Most of us are. So a lot of women listeners with, and I see this all the time in my practice, sex hormone dysregulation, Mm. because they're not optimized up here with the thyroid. So now all their sex hormones are going all over the place. So can you pull in the estrogen topic? Because I found that article really fascinating. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's an area that I've had no choice but to look into because it comes up um, quite a lot. It's not an area that I, I would say, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't advocate that people come to me because they've got a sex hormone imbalance issue. I'm not, I, I don't specialize in that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a thyroid cortisol kind of person, mm-hmm. but I've had to look into it. Um, and I think the biggest well, the biggest single issue is either high estrogen or estrogen dominance that I've seen, mm-hmm. either one or the other. Um, uh, and um, let's one step back. If 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 a, if a woman ha- is is postmenopausal and they have super low estrogen and progesterone, right. that is not a good thing. Period. Right. End of. It's not good because estrogen is really required. To, for, the, for the cardiovascular system to maintain bone density and for the person to feel good and have a, even be able to have a brain still and think and have energy. Mm-hmm. So having at least post proper postmenopausal estrogen and progesterone levels that are balanced properly is important. And, and I've seen so many people that just have had their thyroid issues sort of treated, but they still feel awful. And it's because the estrogen and progesterone either either just in out of balance or just way too low mm-hmm. so that aside having said that um the biggest issue i see is just high estrogen or estrogen dominance um because that that tends to it tends to want lower cortisol a little bit not a huge amount but that can be enough of a knock-on effect um to cause a problem and the other thing it does which a lot, again, a lot of doctors don't understand, is high estrogen or high estrogen dominance tends to lower, tends to increase, sorry, get this right, a thyroid binding globulin. Mm-hmm. So you get, as a result of higher thyroid bind- binding globulin, and you less ha- less free T3 and free T4. Yeah. So it can make the person more hypo as well. So if someone's got high estrogen or estrogen dominance, it's, it's important to try and deal with that because it can help both cortisol and thyroid levels. Okay. So that's probably the single biggest issue I've seen. Less so with low levels, other than low levels that are just too low for the person. But right. I'm, not, I'm not a big expert on this. You probably know much more about this area than I do. Well, no, I mean, you everything that you said was spot on. So if you are postmenopausal and you have bottomed out estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, you need those replaced. We can't be walking around with zero hormones. And then on the flip side, I love what you said in your blog, because you're one of the very few people that I actually hear speak about this relationship. And it was just one sentence, but I picked up on it. The relationship of estrogen to progesterone. You do not need estrogen in the 600s to call yourself estrogen dominant. You could have an estrogen of 300, which on that standard lab value range looks totally normal, but your progesterone is less than 0.3. And that is estrogen dominance. And I speak okay. about that, but I was super happy to see that in your blog. Yeah. Yes, it's, a, it's almost it's almost as bad. I mean, to have that imbalance, you really need to have the estrogen balanced by progesterone. Really important for, for the body to work as it's designed to work. So, right. yeah. Right. And you even mentioned the turning on of Hashimoto's, which I always tie to low testosterone. I've seen a lot of articles on, on low testosterone and that that's 
flipping of the switch to the on position for Hashi, of course, there's you know, stress <laughs> and underlying infections and all those other things yeah. that can turn that switch on too. But even imbalanced hormones can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I've had to learn about it. I have no choice, but, but it's not. And I, and I, t I tend to advise when I see, I do ask people, women to test these things and I see the problem and I, and I, and I you can give some suggestions, but I often suggest that they they go and see someone that's, that really does specialize in treating with bioidentical hormones to get the, get it sorted out properly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not something I, I really want to get into with them because I just don't have the, the experience of doing it. Right, right. And that's fine. I mean, you know, we all have the thing that I respect with any practitioner is when they they focus on their specialty. And if they don't know something, you refer out. I mean, that's what I do. I don't claim to be you know, a kidney specialist. So I'm going to refer you out if you come to me with kidney issues. Uh, Paul, you had mentioned that cortisol, T3, that topic that we dove into is a kind of a portion of your book. But is there anything else that you really wanted to touch on today that you talk about in either of your books? The Recovering with T3, the Thyroid Patient, what's the second one? Thyroid Patient's Manual. I should have it written down right in front of me, but. Right. Yeah, I think the Thyroid Patient's Manual is a really good starter book for, for anyone who's who's got a thyroid problem. I mean, I, I think it's quite sad because when people are, think they've got a thyroid problem or they're originally diagnosed, they're still, majority of them have still got their health and they just handed it over to the, the, the person across the table for them in the surgery and they've handed that health over and mm -hmm. sometimes that can work and the doctor can put them on a treatment that works but in many cases it's just a disaster and it takes that person so long to realize that hmm I need to do something about this I need to learn what's going on here because this isn't working right so I think the thyroid patient's manual is a great book because it really goes into a, 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 a lot of detail still but quite a broad set of information to help someone learn quickly and again I'm a big advocate for learning fast and getting things sorted out fast because that's the way you stop collateral damage happening absolutely um, now do you focus on putting Hashimoto's into remission with antibodies or do you more focus on the free t3 revert which we didn't even get in the reverse t3 but from the free t3 reverse t3 yeah. numbers yeah I I think it, I think it has a, it can work really well. Um, put, putting Hashimoto's into reverse, if you do it really, really early, if you catch it early before there's a significant amount of thyroid damage, the thyroid's still pretty much functioning. Mm -hmm. Then putting it into reverse by whatever means, be it supplements, be it um, LDN, whatever you want to use, can work. But if the thyroid, if it's been going on for quite a while and the thyroid is, is fibrotic and it's just basically dead, yeah. you've already lost the single most important organ of T4 to T3 conversion in the body. Mm -hmm. It's gone. And at that point, um, it, it's not, it doesn't really have the same degree of value. Right. And to be honest, the people that come to talk to me are the people that have been not from pillar to post and being around the houses so many times, they come to me after, you know, five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years in some cases when they're still not well. And at that stage, you know, it, usually that benefit of even attempting it is way past. Yes. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I, and I think too many people get hung up on the antibody numbers. I see, you know, I hear patients, Think, oh, well, but my, my antibodies went up by 50 or they went up by 100. And it's like, you know what? It really doesn't matter if, if you're feeling better, if you're if we're going up in your medication to find that right sweet spot, if your numbers are trending better. Yeah. And, and again, how you feel, because I could I could show you a person with antibodies of 10. And yeah, maybe they've pushed those down. But like you said, Paul, they're their thyroid so far destroyed, they're not going off their medication ever. If they did, they would have zero thyroid hormone. I'm one of those. I went longer with my free T3 test once just to see how much I was actually producing. Uh -uh. Oh, it's too far <laughs> gone. <laughs> well, I, 
Yeah, so I, 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 get, I get to see people and talk to people way too late for that to be of any real use. Yeah. I think if, if you're seeing a doctor on a regular basis and you're having some reasonable health checks that include a look at thyroid and suddenly you can pick this up, yeah, sure, you can get on top of it really fast and may, maybe make a difference and get those antibodies down and see a real benefit. But a lot of people don't get there fast enough. Yep. Not, not no fault of their yep. own, just the way it is. Right, right, exactly. Well, Paul, any last closing words? Anything else you want to tell people about? <sighs> wow. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people think thyroid problems are, are, are really incredibly difficult to resolve. I actually don't think they are incredibly difficult to resolve. You just need the right information, be aware of, of what can be done and have some support from a doctor, the right doctor who is willing to try things out and get on with it. I mean, it's not that hard. It really isn't that hard. Right. So I don't think people should be as down about it and think they have to be locked in this thyroid prison for the rest of their life. They don't have to be. Right. Right. Oh, I'm so happy that you said that because I say the same thing. I think everybody thinks that they're a very tough case because of the amount of time they've been dealing with their symptoms. But yeah. really, I mean, whether you've been dealing with them for five years or 20 years, there's still hope. And it's yeah. not that difficult, like you said. Right. Yeah. Right. So Paul, we're going to put the links to your books because those are classics. I mean, I, I know you're kind of retired, semi-retired right now. Yeah, what are you doing? Are you still seeing patients or are you kind of just laying yeah, low? I've had a few issues this year, so I've not been seeing too many, but I hope to do a few again. I, I am semi-retired. I don't, I'm not working anywhere near like I used to. Mm -hmm. I'll probably keep doing a little bit, um, but, um, you know, I'm 64 in December. And I've been doing this for a long time now uh -huh. and I'm ready to do some other things as well so I won't be completely going away anytime soon but I'm doing a little bit less so well, good at least we still have you in this space for a little bit but we'll link to your books we'll link to your your blog your website like I said it's an amazing source of information for all thyroid patients and again Paul just thank you I'm so happy that we made this work it's been such a pleasure I love the information you give my people desperately need to hear it so this has been amazing Thanks, Amy. Thanks for talking to me. It's been really good. Absolutely.